I'm really honored to be here, and thanks for having me, all of you. Um, I was going to jump right in, and uh, so Ocarina, uh, just a kind of quick background, Ocarina, this is a, as a retrospective, I admittedly think, you know, if you just look at it on paper, there's only been eight years. This is not like, a, you know, some seminal paper that was written like 10 years, 20 years ago. This is, a, this is an app. It's a toy made for your phone uh, eight years ago. And, uh, but, uh, and, and this has really coincided with, you know, kind of the, the, the founding of Smule. Uh, but I will say, in the world of mobile, eight years is like forever. So a lot of things, many things have evolved, have happened since. And in some ways, actually, I look to things like VR and, and AR kind of as in a perhaps similar tipping, a verge of being on the tipping point um, as mobile was maybe eight, nine years ago. So, and um, of course, this coincided with kind of the, you know, kind of, uh, well, the app store and app-based, the beginning kind of what we know is app-based computing uh, with the iPhone and, and then the app store, which basically opened that summer, uh, the same summer the Smule was that started. Um, and also, uh, there was a follow-up, Ocarina 2, and uh, I'm just going to give you a quick demo of this right now, just just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so, so Ocarina is just is a little, it's a flute-like instrument. Uh, some of you may know it from playing Legend of Zelda, the Ocarina of Time. Um, this one does not transport you and teleport you in time or space, but hopefully it will transport you musically, uh, but probably not the way I'm playing it. So you blow into this, and there's actually a, a little program here that's tracking how hard I'm blowing to this that's mapped into the articulation of the sound, which is synthesized um, using multi-touch to control the pitch and then vibrato. Okay. So, um, and uh, you can play a little other ditties on this. Um. So this is a little, it's Ocarina in game mode, where it's kind of telling you what to play next. And it's kind of like Ocarina Hero of sorts, in that it's kind of advising you to play, but unlike Guitar Hero Rock Band, um, it waits for you. So you can, you can just kind of play it at your own pace, and this is by design. And so you can, here I can have a fairly dramatic entrance. And uh, you, can, you can see me tilting the phone downwards to express the ends of longer notes. I always like ending on that chord because it's kind of pretty. So let's do that. Um, so that's that's in a nutshell like the instrument part of ocarina. Um, and, uh, and and there's another side to ocarina which I will get to. But I, I've kind of I've given talks with Ocarina in it a little, quite a few more than probably I, I ever should. Um, so, but this one I've I've taken the ill-advised route of constructing an, an entirely new talk, um, which is probably like the worst thing I, I could have done. But it's it will look familiar, but I think it will feel different. It's a different aesthetic of uh, Ocarina talk, if you will. Uh, so I've broken Ocarina down from different angles. The first one is kind of as an artifact of artful design. And, um, and this is, I would say, this is both the subject of the book I'm writing, but also I think as a retros part of a retrospective, this is kind of thinking back on what Ocarina was, was about and perhaps more than I was able to articulate, definitely more than I was able to articulate at the time, then I can now go back and think about this. And the other thing I would say is a lot of design is perhaps post-rationalization, mm -hmm. which is saying, oh, I meant to do this because it's, uh, it was cool and I was like trying to address this. And I will try to do my best to kind of give you kind of an honest 
a view of what was was I thinking at the time and what was post-rationalization, like, oh, yeah, I meant to do that, when in fact, I'm, I don't know if I did or not. Um, so artful design, and I think this is really kind of a wrangling and a shaping of technology for some purpose. In this case, I would say, if there is a practical purpose, is to play music with it, is to sound and articulate notes uh, with discrete pitch and um, and so, and, and this kind of falls into my kind of definition of design, which is the first part of which is some intention shaping of our world for any practical purpose, practical purpose of, you know, of design. And some of it think of it as kind of the formalization, formalized intent. Some people might articulate it as the articulation of preference. And I, I agree with all of those. And I think that's, you know, this is design. But also to me, design also have the second component, which is doing this shaping of technology with this extreme emphasis on aesthetics. And by aesthetics, I don't mean like the polish you put on it. I mean the very meaning of the thing you're building and what it, how it feels for someone to actually engage with the thing that you're using. Um, and as you can imagine, this has everything to do with the interaction between humans and computers. Um, and as I always think in more kind of concrete terms, no pun intended, uh, to architectural design, um, where there is this undeniable attention both to function, that, that is what you're going to use the building for, and uh, form, the aesthetics. And if we were just purely functional beings, our buildings probably wouldn't, would all be like amorphous blobs that are just the right size for, for us to do whatever in. But instead, we have buildings of all shapes and sizes that have different meanings, to the people that different sense of space, different context, and different you know context in the city and in the region it finds itself in. It's it's so in this this case this is a this is the people's building. Those of you who read Chinese might be inspired to, to read this as a what Chinese character? Ren. So this is the Chinese character for people or human. All right, so, and this is constructed, literally, this building's designed as kind of two halves that meet in the middle, right? And um, this was just, so far, just a design, but I think they're actually building this in Shanghai. But this was presented at the 2010 World Expo in Shanghai and designed by a European firm. Um, and they didn't realize they were actually doing, designing this character until they got to Shanghai. And in Shanghai was like, Dude, this is like the best thing. We got a when are we building this? And they're like, yeah, we meant to do that. Um, <laughs> but they this is uncanny. And and but also if you look at kind of the functional breakdown of this, one side jets out from the water, one side from the land, and one side means it's supposed to smell as kind of spiritual the body, you know, kind of uh, and they meet in the middle in this one thousand room hotel, but you can see all the functional parts of this, but clearly this has a form and aesthetic to it that that is meaningful. I would say that on many different levels. Um, and so if we go back to this idea of design, I think a third thing about design is that it, it's think, helpful to think of design as being, as taking place within a medium. And you know, whether it's concrete uh, or whether it's software, I think that's, you know, it's design needs mediums. And if we were to borrow kind of this, this character, and this is always, I always think of this as one of my favorite characters in Chinese, because it's one, simple to write, but two, it's, there's, there's an implicit social contract that is here, and that's, it's people, and in order for us to, to survive, and perhaps thrive, we, we need to lean against each other. It's two halves leaning on the other. And I think of design in a similar fashion, is that there's these two components. One you might think of as the pragmatics, like what it does, what it's meant to do and also aesthetics, which is how it does it. And I think of aesthetics as basically how we do something, how we live, go about our lives, whereas aesthetics is the things that make life more and worth living. It's, it's what enriches life. So I think these are the two sides of design to me that cannot be divorced from each other. Uh, and if we were to take one side away, you would not have design. Um, so in some ways, I think Ocarina is kind of a type of perhaps micro-architectural design. Um, and, and that's in some ways how I think about this. And if we actually take a closer look at this, whoops, I'm gonna actually plug in the sound to here. Hello. I'm gonna start 
start that over. Same piece that I played, and you can kind of see also how the instrument visually responds. And you can also see kind of the game aspect. The four holes that is dropping down is kind of your cue as to what to play next. But it says nothing about how fast the tempo you're supposed to play this at, and leaving all that to you, and also the accompaniment that you hear is actually following you. So it's, it's really kind of meant to be a very free form, free time um, experience. But then there's, of course, this other dimension to it, uh, to Ocarina, which is kind of a social experiment, a small one, but one that, um, you know, is kind of trying to, when I was designing Ocarina, I, I know that this I can say was what I was thinking about, was that I wanted to do something with Ocarina and on the medium it's in, i.e., you know, kind of this on the iPhone, um, and do at least one thing that you can't do with, like, a, a traditional Ocarina. And by doing that, I think I was trying to justify using this medium at all. I don't really believe in, like, just, co well, I think copying an instrument is dumb with computers. It's actually a principle that, that my advisor, Perry Cook, has, is that copying an instrument is dumb, leveraging expert technique is smart. And um, so I was trying to not just copy the ocarina. I was trying to make it expressive as possible, but then do one thing that I can. And this is the social dimension, which allows you to basically listen in on the world. Um, so let me try to do a little demo of that. I'm going to actually launch ocarina here. And assuming my network works. What rows? See, am I on the right network? Aha. Give me a moment. This is an ocarina that needs uh, you to basically say yes to Stanford Visitor. <laughs> to say, hey, I, I will. Okay, there we go. What is that? Sounds like some Harry Potter going on here. From someone calling themselves Peanut from the middle of the US. Is this from Sydney? No name? Uh, Europe. Stockholm, maybe. Oh, yeah. Um, you hear a lot of Zelda on the globe. Uh, you hear a lot of Amazing Grace on the globe. Um, Amazing Grace is kind of like the stairway to heaven of Ocarina. And that's the one that everyone kind of like feel like they got to learn. Because it's actually the first tablature we put out when we launched the app. And, um, and so if you actually you can get a closer look at this. Little Oceanandoa, swirling music coming out of the globe. And it's, yeah, this is kind of, I would say this is an attempt to like really hide the technology. Ah, Zelda. You can't you can't really go too far without this tech, you know, on the globe without hearing some Zelda. And I think the idea behind the globe was hey, you know, we have technology that is always connected to the internet, uh, at least most of the time. You have GPS location, um, but can we use this to, to do something, you know, a, a little different, do something that no really instrument really can do? And, you know, you don't really know who these people really are. They just give themselves a moniker, but I think the idea is to just give you that tiny bit of connection you have with people out there. 
Epona, I believe that's also the name of Zelda's horse, if I'm not mistaken. So a lot of Zelda, even though they're not, even though they're playing the Beatles, they're still thinking about Zelda. Um, yeah, so this is a, um, okay, one more. Very imperial of Alicia. Okay, so um, that's, so in some ways this is kind of an attempt, uh, it's a social experiment. It's one word saying, okay, we kind of um, allowed you to have an instrument that while you're playing, like kind of make yourself anonymously available to other people also playing the instrument. And that you can just, you know, without knowing who these people are, just know there's someone somewhere out there blowing into a phone or not even just, just playing some music. And whether they're playing something like really recognizable or beautiful or they're just noodling around, you know, I think we can all somehow identify with that because we also have this thing in our hands that we're holding like a sandwich and, and blowing into to make some music. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's ocarina, that's really all of ocarina as, as an artifact. But I think in terms of artful design, if we break it down, these are the different axes that I think of like the design is happening. You know, there was definitely like some program software design, but really it's, it was an exercise in audiovisual design, it was interaction design. It was designed really as an expressive toy, you know, it's, and maybe a game. You know, I would say the toy is something that you without a lot of structure play with, unstructured play, and games are more like, there's there are some goals. And so I'd say maybe the Ocarina Hero mode is more like a game uh, with, you know, you gotta, but then there's also just places for you to just ruminate and, and play. Um, it's, it was a product, you know, this is one of the first products we put out at Smule. And uh, in a time where, uh, it was a great time because I knew that nobody making apps knew what the hell they were doing. So it gave us, it gave me this great sense of like, I can do no wrong because I can do no right. Um, so I'm just gonna do it. Um, that was good, good times. And I, 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 I always feel like industries that don't, that never lose that actually tend to be the ones that continue to really move forward. I think once we feel like, oh, we've stabilized and this is the, these are the trends and these are how people should be doing it. This is the meta of the industry. And then it loses a lot of its, its, its vigor. And, I, and I'm, I'm very interested in industries that, that don't. Uh, but also it's, it's kind of a social design. So I'll go through some of these. Um, first, the audiovisual design and design aesthetic. Um, I think this was an example of what I would call kind of inside out design. You know, this is not, was not an example of a top down process in terms of how this was designed. It wasn't me like going, I think the world needs an ocarina on the phone like something you blow into, this is not it. It was like, it's like playing with, with hey, we have this phone, let's build something. And, uh, and you marry that with some interest and some curiosity. And, and, uh, and the iPhone fit the profile of like a four hole English pendant ocarina, which is about the same size, same weight. And the level of complexity for the interaction is also very similar. There's, you know, on the iPhone, there are five points multi-touch and the four holes, perfect. Um, as a microphone because it's a phone. Uh, and we have the accelerometer, which is something you don't need to worry about usually with ocarinas, but that's an extra thing that we said, well, is there extra bandwidth on the player that we can map this to something meaningful? Um, and uh, so this inside out design is trying to say what, working backwards from the medium. And tinkering the medium, working backwards to see what fits. And ocarina fits more so than a guitar, a piano, a drum set, a harpsichord. You know, did end up designing a piano and a guitar later on, but as a kind of a first instrument, this was one that tries to say, if we design something that could only really work on the iPhone and that took advantage of the iPhone, what would it be? And so this is this exercise in this kind of backwards, top and bottom up design. And the mapping is quite simple. It's really just, you know, but the, the aesthetic part of this is, there were a lot of these apps that were coming out, and I think the way people were thinking about apps, and people still think about apps, is that this is a mobile way to do X, you know? And a lot of people took to like naming their apps, I this, I calendar, you know, I recipe book, I this, I that, and all it is is, at least thinking about it, aesthetically, these are like mobile versions of something else. And those, and some of those are very useful, and, and some of those are great apps, but I think 
the way that I want to think about this is I, I didn't want this to be a facsimile of an ocarina. I wanted your phone, I want you to think and feel that the phone is the ocarina. And that's kind of, that's reflected, I think, in all aspects of the, the interaction design and also the, the audiovisual design. For example, in the interaction design, it's, it breaks away from this model where you're like flipping through your phone like this. You know, you reduce back to like eyes and, in this case, a couple of fingers. Um, but here you're holding the phone like a sandwich and you're blowing into it. So I think it's a very physical, uh, you know, it's a very physical design in that sense. Um, at the same time, uh, you can look at this design, there's just kind of these like, like I wanted to make everything feel as organic as possible. Um, and that's why, as you saw in the video, things actually respond, you know, with animation, things light up when you blow into it. And everything is as fluid as I, as I, I could have made it. And it's coated up in OpenGL and, uh, you're going to see the interface looks something like this, and the circles gracefully expand when you press on it. And, it, and I wanted to, to also combat this, this idea that while there's some very rough tactile feel of, okay, the screen is pushing up against you, that's all it is. It can never be anything more than that, but you can at least try to make fake people into thinking, you know, that there's a little bit more than that. So by having the buttons expand, it feels like you're pressing on an organic thing that responds. And, I, and it's a visual way to kind of make up for the fact that the tactility beyond the touch screen is really not there. Um, and so I invest a lot of times into two things. You can actually see this. There's one, there's some like unhealthy obsession with circles. Um, there are a lot of, just count the number of circles that are on this. Um, and they're not just circles, but they're layers of circles. It's just a whole bunch of like basically circle textures additively blended together that moves independently of each other, that throbs, that light up uh, in response to things. Even this ring, this, this pink ring, is a circle of circles that lights up when you blow into it. The, uh, this is just a subtle reference to Zelda. It's a Triforce. Um, and, uh, but also it marks where you're supposed to blow into the phone. So that's that's really uh, that's that's that, and uh, you know, audiovisual design. I think I've made. I started with these textures like 15 years ago, and I was making like just random stuff with them. And I think I've been using these. Those of you who have taken classes from me at Karma will know how how often I've used these things and how, and to a degree, if I've abused them. But for example, like a button in Ocarina is really kind of these layers of what I call flares, kind of additively blended together and smushed. And when you press on it, you know, some layers contract and some layers expand and they glow. And so this is kind of just a subtle way of, I don't know, just making up again for the, tac the lack of tactile feedback from this. Uh, but also it's something to make, really make the thing feel alive. I want, you know, I, you know, later I made Magic Piano, which had a mode where it's just a piano, which it's slowly breathing, like it's just moving. It's kind of like, it looks kind of like a, like a, it had kind of disturbing actually. It looks like a bug or something that's kind of just, <sighs> but I, I want to give this illusion that these things are, are very, are, are made of flesh and blood. Um, and uh, you can see extreme close up, and I need to clean my fingernail there, but um, extreme close up of the of what it looks like. Um, and you can kind of see everything's additively blended together just to give that additional like, magic feel so that when they actually coincide, they have this extra flaring effect. And uh, same on this side. And of course, this is just an, a lot, lot more of the same exact flares, just much smaller in different colors. Um, and I believe, you know, this is kind of also, in that sense, from a visual aesthetic, it's very minimal. Uh, I've later used the same flares to actually make strings on the magic fiddle. Like if you just have to stretch these out and suddenly you have a line instead of a circle. So uh, I've definitely got my mileage out of these guys. Um, yes. And in terms of, uh, you know, the other thing is I really love spirals. I love things that rotate. Um, so this is, you know, this is another kind of, uh, this is actually, as much an instrument as it is a piece we made for the laptop orchestra, which is, we'll show you an example. This is not ocarina, but this is, a, you know, the kind of kind of visual thinking. This is kind of what this is the thing, it's a piece called Converge that uh, um, then my then grad student uh, Juno and I created for the laptop orchestra, and we basically asked people to submit photos of everyday life of moments 
record some sound of that moment, and there's geotag, time tag, and send it to our server. And we basically collect that here. So this is like a really weird photo album. And, so, and it's weird because I can blow it up. So this is a photo album that's more of a commentary on memory as it is one that's keeping your photos. And guess what it's doing? It's spiraling. Um, <laughs> and uh, well, let's see. You can also bring back memories. This memory is, oh, the joy and light of a sunny day, standing high on the hillside above Golden Gate Bridge, 81 kilometers from here. And this was, you can look at the time, six years, zero months, 23 days, four hours, seven minutes, 41, 42, 43, 44. This is also a really depressing photo album that will forever remind you that these everyday moments are always receding in time from you. You will never be as close to these moments as you are now. Because a second later, it will be that far, much farther away. Um, so it's a really effed up photo album. Um, here's one from a little bit longer ago. Intonation, intonation, intonation. This someone looks like rehearsing some flute um, with a metronome somewhere within a kilometer of here, maybe at Braun. Um, so, and then you can go into the, there's like this vortex of images. And let's turn things into day. Let's make this disappear. Let's add a little, let's wait until the, the actually I'm going to reform them. just so I can blow them up again. The spiral forms a little more quickly in that, in that case. You can kind of see the spiral forming. I can add a little, uh, actually I'm actually going to zoom out. You can really see the spiral here. And I'm actually going to turn it into night. And the more I zoom out, it looks like the galaxy. <laughs> Like I said, I really love spirals. I don't know, they're just beautiful to me. Um, and we can converge this into a single point and blow it up again. And it's a lot of fun. You can see the spiral forming again. This actually crudely obeys Kepler's laws of, well, at least the one which says, you know, can this, this, the rate of rotation is, is somewhat proportional, just proportional to the radius from the center of rotation. So you can kind of see that this, things don't rotate at the same speed, which is also very key for this fluid and organic feel to it. Things always definitely rotate much faster in the center. Um, and let's go ahead and reform this. And this piece ends on a depressing note, too. It basically just clumps up into like this ball and it goes into the distance. I don't know if that symbolizes maybe some, some kind of, seems kind of morbid to me, but this is kind of the, the, the ball of memory that life becomes at some point. So, sorry about that. So anyway, <laughs> um, yes. Okay, everyone is now like super depressed. Uh, but that's where the spirals kind of, you know, I love spirals. Um, Yes. Okay. Uh, on a more, I don't know what kind of a note. Uh, the sound is made in Chuck. Um, it's actually real time synthesized. There's nothing recorded in here. Um, and uh, this is a language that will bring you back to reality because it's a language that will, I like to say, crash equally well on all commodity operating systems that allow you to make sound. And uh, yes, question. Just out of curiosity, why is it named Chuck? Hey, that's a great question. Well, first of all, the symbol on the left is the chuck operator. It's like, it's my, it's, a, it's named after the verb to chuck, which means to kind of carelessly throw one thing into another. So this is a kind of a metaphor for connecting sound making modules, but also for passing data from things to other things. So it's a very left to right language. It's also what I call a strongly timed language. And it has this very like pathologically like imperative uh, way of thinking and programming time. Um, but also I thought Chuck is a good name because it sounds like like your friend, you know. Um, we are working on kind of a codename Project Charles right now as a more nuanced, a more nuanced way to Chuck. Uh, but Chuck is kind of like your friend, even though he crashes a lot. So. Huh? If you've seen Gossip Girl, then no, should I? <laughs> yes, I should. Okay, I'll put that on my list. Cool. It's, I'll, I'll discover why you asked me that. <laughs> Any other questions?
Yes, Charles. Chief. Hello. Hello. Uh, what's Charles? <coughs> what's Charles? Uh, Jack is working on a way to. Jack, can I tell? Yeah. He's working on a way. Actually, do you want to say it? No. <laughs> We are basically adding a layer of kind of in the moment feedback in, into Chuck as you're programming it. We want to know everything from what's working, what's not, to emotional state. Jack has come up with ideas such as like the WTF button that can be used when things don't work as you think they should. We both use this as a way, as kind of extreme analytics, but also as a way to, to gauge people's, I guess, aesthetic and interactive experience they have with Chuck. I want to, I want to, you know, I think programming language is all about, I think for me it's all about making people happy doing the things they got to do. So I, I, you know, Chuck was an attempt at that. I, I, think, I don't think it's there. I think it's like, you know, but we want to know at least, at least one in, as a friend, Chuck wants to know when, when you're not happy um, and when you're happy. So that's Project Charles. TB, TB, TB something, to be done, to be date, to be done. Um, uh, this is the, for those of you who care about the signal processing, it's all it is is a sine wave oscillating another triangle wave as a vibrato that's getting basically enveloped by a, a, a very intricate envelope created from filtering the, the input signal that's the microphone. Instead, it becomes the kind of articulation and that goes through another envelope and that goes to the reverberator. That's it. Um, so, another aspect of design is what I think of as kind of re mutualized design. Um, and this comes from the kind of idea of laptop orchestra. And, and the idea with re mutualized design is the following you know, if we, the one thing that computers allow us to do in terms of making, for example, an instrument is to decouple things more than we ever have. Traditional instruments like a guitar, a ukulele, you know, uh, the sounding mechanism very much has to do with how it sounds, but also how you play it. Those two things are fundamentally in, somewhat inextricably coupled. Computers allow us to say, what is the input? What's the interaction? What's the output? And how do you map them? And the mapping, and, there's no, and the sound making, mecha, sound making mechanism can have nothing to do with the input mechanism. So this means I can make this sound like cats, the ocarina, if I want, instead of the sound that you're hearing. So that's a decoupled Thing. However, that's not all. Just because we can doesn't mean it's a good idea, as with many things. And sometimes that's a good idea, and other times I think we also find ourselves. Oh, the instruments that we build. You know, I think. You know, I, I believe. I believe I've, Bill Verplank, if I may, who's here. I, I, Perry said that some of the instruments he designed, especially the kitchenware, where he's turned cups and tables into instruments, came out of a question that Bill once asked: Is that why isn't anything I do in the computer-mediated space as satisfying as what I do in the kitchen. Um, why isn't anything, why, isn't, why aren't the things I do in the computer-mediated space as interesting, as nuanced, as satisfying as, as, the, as what I do in the kitchen? I don't know if, I don't know if you can attest to after having said that. OK, great. So it's, uh, um, I, I think there's certain things that, about playing computer music instruments that, that are that feels very weird. It's, it operates can can operate at very different levels depending on how physically you make the thing uh, to how abstractly you make the thing. You know, so I think the notion of playing an instrument is fundamentally different for for computers. So and, and then not surprising, a lot of times we kind of yearn for that old sense of intimacy that we want to have with our instrument. Um, and, uh, and we want to also feel like the sound is really coming from the instrument rather than from the computer through, you know, the speakers around us. So in that sense, you know, this is kind of an exercise in remutualizing the interaction with the sound into a single object. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read. Actually, I will read this real quick. This is from a paper that Rebecca Fiebrink, Crary, and I authored about kind of creating like physical interfaces, you know, in 
And really what this is about is essentially a design ethos of taking whatever inputs and sensors happen to be available and thinking as broadly as possible with interactive affordances, the ethos recognize that physicality and extreme convenience can coexist and together have a tremendous positive effect on instrument building, composition performance, and teaching. Furthermore, taking further taking familiar input capabilities and co-opting them in unfamiliar ways can imbue expressive musical interactions with a sense of playfulness, something we try to cultivate in much of our music making and teaching. This is thinking about designing instruments specifically for the physical laptop. And, um, and so as an example of that, here's another project. <laughs> the laptop accordion with Sanjay and Aiden's. That would be our moment of zen. So that's Sanjay and that, that, oh yeah. Uh, that uses like computer vision optical flow, basically tracking the rate at which you're opening and closing the lid, and that's it. And that's mapped in the same, similar way that articulation is mapped in, in Ocarina. And this is kind of another example of remutualizing re things, um, but also as an example of very physical design. Um, a precursor to Ocarina in terms of design is also the sonic lighter. You know, this app is no longer available. This is lost in the antiquities of app time. Um, but like Ocarina, this can be seen as a predecessor to Ocarina, even though it's not a musical instrument. For one, just like Ocarina, this is, it makes no attempt to add any kind of like embellishment to, like there's no skin to this lighter. Just like there's no casing to the Ocarina. And the whole idea is part of the aesthetic that, hey, your phone is the thing. So here is the lighter that that you know it all has these functional elements, and uh, and this of course is a very silly thing because it fails at doing the one thing that lighters are supposed to do. Um, it can never do that, um, but it also had the social component that allows you to at least see where other people around the world have uh, lit up, and also presumably spent a dollar buying a fake lighter on their iPhone, and so that's uh, you know. This is actually the video we made to launch this product. This is actually the first Smule product. Response to the touch, again, organic. Uh, you can actually um, light other phones, even if you can't light anything else. This is actually done through sound in the form of very crude near field communication. You can blow it out. So it already uses the microphone and then, and of course we have this like, Luke Saturna to, to underscore that we really are a cult of iPhone users. <laughs> you can blow it out. And there's one more that, doesn't sh that I, don't sh I don't show here is that if you rotate it halfway, the flame singes the top of your phone, resulting in smoke particles and a really sickening singeing sound, like it's burning the side of your phone. As if, say, this flame is really inside your phone. So this is kind of, again, the, you know, this is one of like probably dozens if not hundreds of lighters. I mean, we weren't the only one to say, we just make a lighter. You know, like many other people had the same idea at the same time. But I think we're the only one which the flame can virtually burn your phone from the inside and you can blow it out and things like that and you have a globe. So this is kind of a, a lighter that, despite its complete worthlessness as a lighter, is, an, is a design experiment in a lot of other things. Um, to things like, you know, a blog wonder if that was the most northern most recorded iPhone user. Like that's in the that's in the middle of nowhere. It's inside the Arctic Circle. There's no visible landmass on any map that we could find there. There's six different signatures, six different phones out there with Sonic Lighter. Who are they? Are they signaling for help with their phone? <laughs> and uh, we don't know. And uh, the thing is, you don't really need to know to feel that sense of connection in this kind of social sphere. If we zoom into Pasadena. We see that another user has left us an emphatic, unmistakable message. I'm going to 
the, the way to do this is you can, of course, just walk down the street and every few feet blow it out and light up the, the, the thing again. And you're going to see how big this is compared to like you know the, the football stadium up there. So maybe they're in a car. I don't know. Uh, who is this? It doesn't matter. Somebody did this. <laughs> Good job. Um, and by the way, it's in the earlier design thinking and aesthetics we have, we, we kind of had this very crude way of thinking, wow, what is, how, does, how do our apps fall in? Like when we thought of two camps as one way to think about this. And we termed this NASCAR versus NPR, okay? With the assumption that these two represent populations which are mostly like not intersecting. Um, you know, so I would say the lighter probably, perhaps is more NASCAR, not to say M people who listen to NPR don't use lighters, but I would say Ocarina is definitely like NPR. I don't, you know, and NASCAR, I kind of stereotypically think like someone who's hunting goes to Bigfoot, like big, like Bigfoot truck rallies and go to WWF wrestling. And, uh, and NPR is like we sit around and uh, we, we think about ocarinas and uh, all day. So I don't, I don't know. So this is a this is a kind of a crude, admittedly crude way to think about. But you know, full disclosure here, this is kind of how how we were thinking of that. And actually, ocarina when it first came in the store, and became actually the number one selling app for for like three weeks. We unseated an app called iHunt, which was squarely in the NASCAR classification to us. And it was we. There was an extra. It was an extra satisfying moment when we when it was like, I don't know, ocarina over over hunting, um, which actually might bring me to another bigger question of why, why ocarina? Uh, certainly, like it's been, you know, it, it's something that we did not expect would be so. Would actually have such resonance. You know, we built it because it's, it seemed like a fun thing to do, um, but now like. It's like there's over something like 10 million users of Ocarina. Um, and many of them took to the internet and uh, made videos of themselves playing this. And this is basically like the marketing department's dream. Um, of like when you have users basically making marketing videos for you. Um, and but also it underscored how you know people did resonate with this. And I think it has to do with, again with this this disarming fact that it's on a phone. Like if I hand you a violin and say, be creative with this, if, if you play a violin, they're like, sure. But if you don't, like me, I'm like, I don't know how to do that. But I'm like, hey, is it on my phone? It's kind of a game. I can learn this. Sure. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a good icebreaker, I guess. You know. Um, so here's one of our users. This is why I love the iPhone. <laughs> Sometimes people do things you don't expect, like blow into this phone with your nose. She turned out to be a long, like a lifelong nose flautist. She's played nose flute on a variety of different types of flutes. And this is just the latest flute to be nosified. And uh, she was one of the winners in our Ocarina video contest. Uh, I think the contest is like, this blows Ocarina video contest. And we send her the prize money, a t-shirt, and a box of Kleenex for her troubles. Um, but I think this has to do with kind of what Michael mentioned in the beginning is that a lot of this was an attempt and experiment in designing things to kind of bring music expression back into, into kind of more of casual amateur setting. You know, if you think about 100 years ago, before household electricity, and you marry that with this, this well-documented um, truth that there's never been a civilization on this planet that has been without either music or dance. So music has always been with us. But we haven't always had computers, MP3s, radio, recording. Those all happened pretty much in the last hundred years. So some in the other like thousands of years before household electricity, how do people make music? Well, the logical answer is people made made it where it was heard and heard it where it was made. So and also in fact, you know, it was well documented that families played music as just a form of entertainment. And also, at some point, the word amateur meant something really positive. It meant you loved something. That's actually, if you break down the word, it actually means one who loves. All right? So it's a, a more amateur. Um, it's a, but now, of course, you know, we, you know, it's, it's it, within the, the context of amateur, we think of like 
it's like, oh, like don't quit your day job and don't don't do anything that's you, know, you have no expertise in, you know. But I th- I think there's something nice in doing things that you have no expertise in when you do it for things like enriching, you know. And there's something there's something is incredibly enriching and joyful about making music that is entirely different than listening to it, which is admittedly wonderful in, in its own right. But, but making music is 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 a diff- it's a joy of a different different type. So in some ways, I think you can think of these kind of instruments that expressive toys as a way to kind of infiltrate the masses and get people to play more music. And I think that's kind of a, a barometer of success. It's like I don't like I don't need people to be playing this at the next like you know Carnegie Hall like concert. People, if people are playing this in their dorms and living rooms, I don't know, in line at Starbucks, that's a win. Because you know what, people have. Been, made more music, which in my mind is like, that's just, that's just better. The world's just, just a slightly better place because people did that. Um, this is another launch video. We did the Zelda one and we did Stairway. I'm very much into designing anachronisms. So this is like, this is, you know, if the lighter was a cult, this is kind of the hippie commune of iPhone users. This is why we have this rug that we're sitting on. And this crystal orb that's in the middle here, check that out. And then there's, that's the mule. It's a field marketing specialist. So yeah, so we, you know, we kind of made it, trying to make it as easy as possible for people to actually just go in and play this thing. Um, and I'll just go through quickly game design. You know, this, in some ways this is, it's not really, I think this is an instrument before it's a game. It's a toy before it's a game. But I think there are game-like elements in here. And so I think of this as gamification, which is really, goes by a lot of other names which I don't have time to go into, but really it's kind of the use of game design elements in non-game context. And here the goal is to get people to want to get better at playing the instrument, whether it's ocarina or magic piano and whatnot. So, and, and so briefly I'll just mention that, you know, we deal with these notions of playing versus gaming, where one is more freeform and unstructured and improvisational, and the other is structured. And I would say with ocarina, you know, the design challenge is making music making games that are expressive, games that have potential to motivate expressive behavior while allowing for playful, open creativity, in essence, combining those two concepts. And the observation is that musical instruments do appear more specialized uh, than games, where games appear more, it's easier. And uh, we can probably harness things, I think, like flow theory to help people lose themselves in playing music. And I think games of nothing, is, it seems to me like engineered to actually bring about flow. That's kind of one of its implicit, tacit goals. Um, and also, I think the point here is that games don't have to come at the expense of expressiveness. I think you can have both. I'm a kind of like, have your cake and eat it too kind of guy. All right, so have your game and expressiveness too. So design a lot of other, since Ocarina, we design a lot of other music making games um, that range from kind of, and you know, each of these have its own angle. Uh, Magic Piano actually had a, a duet mode that you can play with a random person with like the, the most atrocious latency possible. Um, and uh, Magic Fiddle had a storybook that had missions for you to go play the Magic Fiddle for like your family, a pet. Go busking on the street with your Magic Fiddle and report back. It's kind of like social homework. Um, Ocarina 2, which actually introduced the game mode. Leaf Trombone World Stage is a, is a kind of a crowdsource thing where we basically had like people like play on the world stage and then people also serve as kind of juries and kind of like a like a panel kind of like uh, like American Idol style and give you feedback on your playing and it sounds awful and which is part of the aesthetic I suppose so um, Ocarina 2 you can you know the, we try to also think of things in terms of the musical aspects pitch this is user control, but the timing is open-ended and user-driven, and the complexity is, complexity is fairly multifaceted. And these are kind of three dimensions I think of when I think of designing games. If you look at Magic Piano, the pitch is actually not user-controlled, but kind of baked in. The timing is 
open still, complexity is much simpler. So you can kind of apply this way of, of organizing kind of musical games uh, in, with other things. Uh, finally, a social design. Uh, this is the full kind of, this is the instrument, but well, actually, actually there's a server with a database uh, that's actually housing mm, Ocarina snippets, which are basically being captured as you played, as you're playing, and they're geotagged, they're time tagged, and they're just getting served back to you when you go to the globe. All right. And within this is the idea that technology should, you know, I, I like this idea of technology creating calm. I also like this idea of technology transcending the medium itself into something that, that allows you to, to make more human connections. Um, and I absolutely believe in trying to, you know, s foreground substance while hiding the technology. Sometimes, you know, not knowing what the mechanism is, is, is critical. And here, all we want you to feel is that there's someone somewhere out there. It's, this is not possible without technology, but this, you know, hopefully is something that, that, that that's, you know, technology should not be the first thing people think about when they come to the globe. You know, that's, that's, that's the hope. And people do play all kinds of things. Um, and so, in some ways, the globe was designed as this experience of feeling lonely and connected at the same time. And I want this idea of, you know, feeling visceral and bringing this visceral human side to no matter how small, I think the scale is not important. I think authenticity of the experience is important. So it's not trying to make this earth shattering like let's all sing and create harmony, even though that seems like a worth, worthy goal. This is like there's someone somewhere out there playing like Final Countdown from, from Korea. Who are they? You know, I think that's in its own way calm and in, in my, and I think it's something of perhaps even something sublime in that. Um, there's, a, there's one quote I will leave you with, which came from the iTunes review. I'll read it for you. This is my piece on Earth. I'm currently deployed in Iraq, and hell on Earth is an everyday occurrence. The few nights I may have off, I'm deeply engaged in this app. The globe feature that allows you hear everybody else in the world playing is the most calming art I've ever been introduced to. It brings the, exact, the entire world together without politics or war. It's just the exact opposite of my life. All right, so in deployed U.S. soldier, and this is it's like, oh wow, you know, we didn't expect to see this, but this clearly he had a, I think, a human experience and reaction to this, which brings me then to I'm going to end with kind of this designing Ocarina kind of as a, as a creative process. Like I said, design is post rationalization. I wish I could tell you that, you know, I designed Ocarina because I want the world, to, I wanted music for the masses, I want people, everyday people, to play music. Uh, and I want it to be like this surreal, like artistic experience. Uh, no, I think I think I think for me, like, and I think I, I think for any creative process, I, I, th I think it's one where it's just curious. It's like, can I do this? And I think that's probably the overriding impetus for designing Ocarina. And within that, it's like trying to do something that you can't do anywhere else with this technology. Like I said, justify the technology and to do it as beautiful as possible. Whatever shakes from that, let it, let it be. And you know, kind of, if the medium is the message, then let's craft something with the medium that has, that has a message. Um, and uh, so, you know, design ethos and takeaways, you know, there's, I think the world is, is I, I, you know, for a while we thought the world was going to go more and, more and more and more virtual. And certainly there's things in that direction. But we actually, actually things are becoming more physical, are also becoming more physical with research in AR, drones, but also in simple things as just turning a phone into a physical instrument. Um, again, high the technology foreground substance. And also this idea that, you know, anything that's worth designing to me is worth designing beautifully in striving in search of something that is sublime. And I think that's, that's true not only from a beauty point of view, but I think practical problems, when we design solutions for them, um, aesthetics is arguably more important, if not just as important in those cases. Because at the end of the day, we humans are not purely functional, utilitarian creatures, we're also, we're also aesthetic ones, you know, and, and as much as, you know, Jackie once said, you know, we have, we as human beings have this urge to lean forward, to all forever hurdle ourselves 
into futures of increasingly more advanced technology, unchecked by perhaps some collective wisdom to like do so wisely, right? Uh, I think that is true, and you know, I, that's not a very good outlook for like people now, because uh, like I think we're just going to destroy ourselves before we know it in this pursuit of this leaning in, this, this curiosity that is both good and maybe not. But at the same time, I think all is not lost. And to me, it's like people also respond to beauty, to delight, to kindness, much more so than they respond to the opposite of these things. And therein lies kind of this practical purpose, if you will, of art and artful design, in that it's, it's here to balance that out. There is, there's, you know, it's an intentioned way to make beauty, but perhaps a more tacit and unintentioned purpose of actually soothing the savage beast, if, if you will. Um, so, you know, I know this is just a, like a flute on a phone, um, but I think, you know, I think it does definitely makes me think that the things we design, whatever it is, how, no matter how simple or how, you know, no matter how simple I think it's, it's worth doing so. So anyway, so I'm writing about all this in this book, and it's, it's coming out sometime. Um, and uh, I want to thank quite a few people, certainly those who made, you know, all everything from laptop orchestra to all the Smule products possible at Smule Karma. Um, and also thank you all for listening. So in a in the globe future, um, in a densely populated urban area, there's obviously going to be multiple people like available to listen to, right? Um, and what exactly do you optimize for here? Right? You, you could surface the guy who's like the more experienced one who will probably be playing something that's more pleasant to listen to, and therefore it'll boost user engagement, hopefully, right? But like, um, like, like what are the things that you like uh, take into consideration about? Like, well, it's, it's, it's a good question. We do have a kind of a very crude algorithm that def, that figures out what to serve up next in turn on the globe. Um, and there's also there are filters you can apply. You, know, you, you can apply for you can apply a filter which says. I want to hear things that people have heart. There's a heart on here. You can just basically that's like like, and I only want to hear things that have been like hearted a lot. Um, so that typically will give you some fairly skillful playing. Um, at the same time, I actually like the noodling. I like hearing people kind of like stumbling over themselves playing this because I do that too when I'm when I'm when I'm practicing, and I feel like I'm hearing people in just like normal moments. And then there are people who like just I don't know if it's a bug. In the, in the server or the, the rendering algorithm, but it's just like play these really, really, really long notes. <laughs> and I, I always think of that as kind of like a very minimal free jazz type of situation. <laughs> so I also have, my mind is always interpreting what I'm hearing. Um, and um, yeah, people have listened to each other something like, I don't know, 40, 50 million times on the globe. So it's something that they do. And people have even said, you know, we, sometimes we, we actually just have this on during dinner. And I'm like, cool. I've never, I've never done that, but you know, that's awesome. Um, so, but we we don't really. The other part of the algorithm tries to kind of foreground maybe like newer content, and that's really it. And there's nothing more sophisticated than that. We could do more like kind of information retrieval and try to serve a more interesting content. But I think luckily, not quite by design. But luckily, the uh, it's actually interesting to listen to both and really skillful people, but also like because of the casual nature of this to just everyday playing. Great question. Yes? What would be your philosophy of, for example, augmenting, augmenting the form to sound like a device versus augmenting the actual physical flute or the actual physical musical, musical instrument with digital functionality to make it do the things that, that doesn't? Uh, I'm I'm down for to do both. Uh, from if from I were to put a philosophical flag on in the ground, uh, we do do that as do the other things as well. We kind of augment things, uh, not always to great success, but sometimes. I mean, I think some people, some players actually have additional bandwidth that they can apply to other expressive things. So if, you know, um, people have augmented everything from trumpets to sitars to tabla putting censored on them to do, make, have them do things that the traditional instrument can, cannot, cannot do. Um, and uh, for me, like, I don't 
I probably tend to more work more in the in, in the like kind of design things out of technology inspired by existing instruments or kind of some whimsical thing. Um, but I, occasionally, I, I, I work with the other thing, and a lot of my colleagues and, and, and students actually absolutely work on kind of like augmenting existing instruments. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I'm, we'll take the other ones offline. He's okay. still here, but please come on. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Thank you.